ladies and gentlemen, we're back. It does feel very good to say that we are back with another Darkest Iceberg installment. I love doing these videos, I find them so interesting, and yet again I have pulled off another iceberg video full of interesting, sinister and dark stories of the world of football. Just to quickly run through, I'm sure you already know what the iceberg series is, but of course no, we're not talking about icebergs in the Arctic Circle, we're talking about the idea, the concept of an iceberg, where the tip you only see the surface and the deeper you go down an iceberg, the darker and more sinister it gets. So tell me your thoughts down below. Hope you guys do enjoy. Smash the like button. Let's hit 5,000 likes. Subscribe if you're new for more. And also, Mozilla Designs to Code UK, my own football design company. We have just hit 10,000 orders on the website, which I'm so proud of. So thank you so much for that. So let's do 20% off all items used called iceberg for any item on the site. So with that said, sit back, relax, and let's get into it. Let's start off with something that I actually never knew, and maybe you didn't either. The story goes all the way back to the 14th of December 2000. This came from a man called Horatio Gagioli. I've definitely butchered that name, I'm so sorry. Gagioli was a agent who actually saw Messi live at only 12 years of age. The story goes that Messi was given a trial at Barcelona and he was actually in two minds from his father. He was in the middle of the side between Barcelona or Real Madrid, mainly because Barcelona wasn't too sure about taking Messi in due to his stature. A Barcelona executive in Carles Resach, I'm definitely butchering these, I'm so sorry. In his own words said that it only took him a few minutes to know that he's seen someone special. Now, of course, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but maybe he actually did think that. However, Messi's father was not too convinced and was threatening to take Messi away and seeking a trial at Real Madrid. So in a quick turn of events, Messi was signed, but it was all on a whim. They were not in an office and they had no intention of making a signing that day. So they used the next best thing, a paper napkin that was given by a waiter. On the image you see in front of you is the paper napkin held by Horatio Gagioli, an agent involved in Messi's transfer to Barcelona, stating on a napkin the following, signed by all parties involved. And that is officially how Messi was signed to Barcelona. I'm actually surprised that I never knew that. The Jabulani. The Jabulani is a football, if you don't know. Back in the 2010 World Cup, there was this ball right here, which was called a Jabulani, which um, had a lot of criticism by a lot of the players and staff of each nation. Um, some more than others, some loved it, some hated it. Mostly hated it. I don't know how to explain it, but simply put, there was something weird about this ball that made it erratic and unpredictable. And I believe the reason is, is that it was too round. I, I, I don't know how that's f***ing possible for football, but here we are, lads. Apparently, the ball was designed so well to be so round and curved by Adidas that it was too round that when the ball was hit, how it reacted to the air it became erratic and it moved and it swayed a lot. Therefore, if you're a goalkeeper, good luck. That's pretty much the point here. Many goalkeepers coming out and complaining, many players coming out and complaining, many managers and staff members coming out and complaining, and it created many incredible goals for the World Cup and a lot of um, a lot of tears. But, all in all, the Jabalani will always go down in football history of being one of the most iconic and most recognized footballs there is out there because of a ball being too round. I, I still don't know how that even makes any sense of a, a, a ball that's too round, but there you go, boys. Jabalani, always a place in my heart for being just a f***ing great laugh. Luis Suarez handball. Never say Luis Suarez to a Ghanaian. Just simply put, don't do it. You may actually get stabbed. I don't want to say that Ghanaians stab people, but when it comes to Luis Suarez, they may have an exception. We're staying in the 2010 World Cup, and in the quarterfinal in South Africa, this is held in Africa, Ghana being potentially a African nation in a World Cup semi-final. This hits hard, because what happened is that in the extra time, there was a chance, and Luis Suarez on the line hit the ball with his hands, 
blatant handball, gets given a red card, he's sent off, and it goes to a Ghana penalty, okay? Asamoah Gayan steps up. The entire country is watching. The entire continent is watching him to send an African nation to a semi-final of an African World Cup, and he missed it. And he missed it. And Luis Suarez, what really hurt was the celebrations because, of course, Uruguay went on from that miss to go win on penalties. And Luis Suarez was held as a hero. In simple terms, cheating. He purposely cheated um, and took the risk of going to down to 10 men. And somehow it worked out for him. So it's genius. But uh, don't say that to a guy in, otherwise, he may actually kill you. To this day, just Luis Suarez is not a word that is spoke about in that country. Steven Gerrard slip. After 24 years without the title coming back to Anfield, in the 2013-14 season, it finally looked like the year that Liverpool would go on to win the Premier League. Liverpool played Chelsea at home. The team coach each week was greeted by fans chanting, we're going to win the league. Liverpool were only three wins away from winning the Premier League after previously beating Man City earlier in the month. Up faced a weakened Chelsea side in the middle of two Champions League semi-final legs. In that win to Manchester City, Steven Gerrard got the players together in a speech saying, we do not let this slip. Well, on this fateful day, things took an incredible turn. Just before half time, a pass came from Mamadou Sako as it came to Steven Gerrard. For some reason, the ball slips underneath his foot, allowing Demba Barr to run straight on through on goal and tucking it past Simon Mignolet to put Chelsea ahead. Liverpool went on to lose that game 2 0 to Chelsea. However, they had another chance away at Crystal Palace. Liverpool was 3 0 up in a game away at Palace with a title at their mercy until a miraculous comeback made it 3-3 by an equaliser by Dwight Gale. This put it in the hands of Manchester City and Liverpool went on to lose that Premier League title. To this day, still one of the most incredible mistakes in Premier League history, the abandoned derby. In the 2004-09 quarterfinals, AC Milan came up against their fierce rivals, Inter Milan. After AC Milan won in the first leg 2-0, all eyes was on the second leg. And after a Shevchenko goal in the 30th minute, AC Milan looked like they were home and clear to win the tie. But it got a bit wild, as the match descended into chaos in the second half, with Inter fans repeatedly throwing flares onto the pitch. As the flares and fireworks continued to land on the San Siro pitch, referee Marcus Merck twice suspended play and called for a stadium announcement to ask them to stop. However, as smoke filled the stadium, AC Milan's goalkeeper Dida was hit by a flare thrown from the crowd, and the referee Merck immediately abandoned the game. The UEFA officials backed the referee's decision. AC Milan were handed a 3-0 walkover by UEFA. Inter were later given a £132,000 fine for the incident and ordered to play their following four European matches behind closed doors. One of the very rare times in the entirety of European Cup history that a match had to be abandoned. Vuvu Zalers. Now, yes, this may seem like a really weird um, point to come after what we just said. However, I could put this on a very, very serious level here because this is the worst thing that has ever been created known to man. I fucking hate Vuvu Zalers. It ruins the World Cup. I could, I can't go back to that World Cup and watch any highlights, watch any commentary, watch anything about it without just hearing. Nah, nah. No! You get what I mean? <laughs> what, 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 what's happening? Here? Whose idea was it to get this little fucking horn thing and to literally who who sold that? I need to I need to know five hundred blocks outside every single stadium with these fucking horns. Who got that going? Who thought? Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Ah! Duckerdam, 1986. One of the most incredible European Cup finals. Helmuth Duckerdam was a goalkeeper for Stella and wasn't the best player even in the national team as he only played two times for the Romanian national team. However, despite his lack of appearances for the Romanian national team, he became a legend of Romania. On May the 7th, 1986, the Romanian goalkeeper in the city of Seville earned a place in Romanian folklore as he single-handedly at the stage gave Romania its proudest footballing moment, a European title. Stella Bucharest won the UEFA Champions League and in incredible fashion, beating Barcelona in a penalty shootout, saving not one, not two, not three, but four penalties 
in a single shootout. Four penalties taken, four penalties saved. Potentially one of the greatest stories in European Cup history. Not just a fantastic underdog story, but a fantastic way to do it as well. Everyone raise your glass and have a toss to the man himself, the hero himself, Helmuth Duckerdom. The Surface Kieran Gibbs red card. On March 22nd, 2014, the most baffling refereeing decisions took place. In a match between Chelsea and Arsenal for Arsene Wenger's 1000th game in charge. In a match that led to a 6-0 thrashing of Arsenal. You would have thought this would have took the headlines, but a refereeing clamour by Andre Mariner stole the headlines. With Arsenal already two goals down after seven minutes, Alex Oxide chamberlain desperately used his hand to tip Eden Hazard's shot around the post on the line, conceding a penalty and a certain red card. However, unfortunately for Mariner, he thought it was Kieran Gibbs that made the handball and showed the red card to the wrong man. Kieran Gibbs were understandably furious and confused, with Oxlade Chamberlain pleading to the referee that it was him and begged that Kieran Gibbs would be rescinded. However, by the rules, the decision was final and the left back made his way down the tunnel. This has to be one of the most embarrassing errors in refereeing history, especially at the top level. Adebayor celebration. In the year 2009, Emmanuel Adebayor transferred from Arsenal to Manchester City. Despite playing for Arsenal, Adebayor publicly discloses his hatred for the club after the way that he was treated, describing Arsene Wenger as a fake manager. Adebayor claimed that in a meeting between him and Arsene Wenger in his office, Arsene Wenger told him that he didn't see a future at Arsenal anymore for Emmanuel Adebayor. Adebayor had no choice but to join Manchester City. Allegedly, Arsene Wenger had a press conference the day after his signing for Manchester City, stating that Adebayor left because he wanted the money. Adebayor did not appreciate that, so when he scored against Arsenal in the 80th minute, he did the most incredible celebration, sprinting as fast as he could to the other end of his ground, and no one was going to stop him. The former Arsenal man ran the length of the pitch to slide on his knees in front of the away section. Coins, lighters, and even a plastic stool rained down on the pitch from the away end. Adebayor practically set off a riot. Paul the Octopus. Paul the Octopus was a famous gimmick back in the 2010 South Africa World Cup and was a very simple concept. It was an aquarium in Western Germany that, at the start of the World Cup, had a little gimmick where he had two boxes and each having a separate nation's flag. They put food in each of the boxes and Paul the Octopus decides which one to eat from first. And the first box with their nation's flag on it, that would be the team that would go on and win the game. Throughout the 2010 World Cup, he predicted eight games and got all eight games correct. This included each of Germany's group stage games where he picked Germany each time to win and then he predicted Germany to beat Argentina, England, but for the semi-finals he predicted Spain to beat Germany and Spain of course went on to beat Germany. He predicted Germany to beat Uruguay in the third place playoff and in the final between Netherlands and Spain he again predicted Spain. So what is the conspiracy? Well, this all came from Jiang Zhao, who is a director and created a thriller titled Who Killed Paul the Octopus? Theory that Paul the Octopus actually was dead for the last three months and was 60 to 70% sure that he died in July and was secretly replaced by his keepers to keep the gimmick going. When being asked why do they believe this, she added, Octopuses all look the same. It is impossible to tell the difference. I don't need to really explain any more. 1966 World Cup fixed. A very, very popular conspiracy. And this all came from the former FIFA president, Zhao Havlange, who was a former president that was in office from 1974 until 1998. He made the claim that the 1966 World Cup was fixed alongside the 1974 World Cup. In 2008, spoke out saying that it was planned for the host countries, England and Germany, to win. Havlange, who is Brazilian, of course also added that Brazil was hard done by by this and at the time, they were the best in the world that won the 1962 and 1970 World Cup. His proof of why this was rigged 
came from only one thing, that British referees was picked for the 1966 World Cup for the large chunk of it. Picked by the FIFA predecessor, who was also English in Sir Stanley Roos. This did add a little bit more believability when of course the goal in the actual 1966 World Cup final, when Jeff Hurst's shot was given as a goal claiming that it went over the line. Many believe that it did not go over the line and proof that it was indeed rigged and that the tournament was rigged for the host nation to win. Argentina versus Peru 1978 final. You may not have realized if you look down the history book, but Argentina beat Peru 6-0 in a World Cup final. They beat them 6-0. After the triumph, there were some alleged dirty tricks by the dictator of the time called, called George Fidela, or I, I, I'm probably saying that wrong, but Fidela. So if you don't know, in the 1978 World Cup, Argentina could have got knocked out of the group stage, and they had to go and win a game, the last game of the group stage, by a large, large margin. Came up Peru, in which they beat Peru 6-0, and it's been led by an investigation that there were some foul play that could have been happening in place in terms of bribes to the Peru team, and more specifically, the Peru goalkeeper, both leaders at the time between Argentina and Peru, struck a deal that they would allow Argentina to beat them by more than four goals to confirm themselves through to the next round. Peruvian members came out saying that Videla needed to win the World Cup to cleanse Argentina's bad image around the world. Of course, this was a time, of course, of the Falklands War between Argentina and England. This is all accusations and allegedly there's been no official confirmation that they were bribes in place, but they beat Peru 6-0 and they needed the four goals to make it to the next round. So I'm just saying. Aaron Ramsey curse. One of the most famous conspiracies that I've I've known growing up is the Aaron Ramsey curse. This is the famous curse that when Aaron Ramsey scores a goal, a famous celeb passes away only days afterwards. The deaths caused by Aaron Ramsey seem to be between three days after the goal, and 21 people have been claimed by Aaron Ramsey, allegedly. This includes Andreas Montez, Osama Bin Laden, Steve Jobs, Gaddafi, Whitney Houston, Paul Walker, and Robin Williams, with many more. Aaron Ramsey scored 80 goals during his career, and only 20 goals seem to have some sort of link. A newspaper called El Mundo about his beliefs about this conspiracy, he said that it is a stupid rumour and that he does not find it funny in the slightest. The Body Juventus vs Ajax 1996 Another big moment in another European final, where the stakes cannot be any higher, some teams take matters into their own hands to be in charge of their own destiny. This was a Juventus team of Alessandro Del Piero, Gianluca Vialli, and Fabrizio Ravinelli, up against Ajax, who were the reigning champions and the envy of the entirety of Europe, of the likes of Edwin van der Sar, Yari Littmanen, Patrick Kluivert, and Edgar Davids, and both the Boer brothers. Led by Louis van Gaal, they were the team to beat in Europe. The game went on as normal, as Juventus won on penalties. After the game finishing 1-1, Juventus won 4-2 on penalties. Although Juventus won the Champions League final, the victory remains controversial because of accusations of doping. In November 2004, the Juventus club doctor, Ricardo Agricola, was given a 22-month prison sentence and fined €2,000 for sporting fraud by providing performance enhancing drugs, specifically EPO, to players between 1994 and 1998. Doctors confirmed that they were practically certain that two players in Antonio Conte took EPO, which is also known as ethro Poetine. I'm so sorry for butchering that. They also claimed that it was very likely that at least eight other players on the team, including Del Piero and Didier Deschamps, was also taking this too. Despite these accusations, they always remained that accusations, and that in the years of 1994 to 1998, there were no positive proof by any Juventus players during this time. However, still to this day, Ajax general manager still feels bitter and sick, feeling like Ajax were cheated out of a second Champions League title. Cantona Karate Kick In what was potentially the most shocking moment in Premier League history, on January 1995, Crystal Palace hosted Manchester United. And on this night, Eric Cantona, Manchester United's legendary player, ended up 
in a prison cell. The match was a ordinary 1-1 draw and Cantona had been sent off. He was dismissed for kicking out on Richard Shaw after losing his temper with a series of rough challenges. Cantona made his way to the tunnel until supporter Matthew Simmons rushed down to the front row at Selhurst Park. He taunted Cantona saying, off you go Cantona, it's an early bath for you. In court, Cantona claimed that there was a crude insult aimed at his mother. The United man lost all control, breaking away, jumping over the advertising boardings to aim a kung fu kick at supporter Simmons before following up a series of punches. After being pulled away by his teammates, Cantona eventually left the field, but everyone left the stadium astonished. The punishment was severe. The FA banned him for nine months, calling the attack a stain on our game. He lost France captaincy and was never selected for his country ever again and had a two week jail sentence reduced to an appeal of 120 hours of community service. Years later, when Cantona was asked about his greatest moment in the game, he said, I have a lot of good moments, but the one I prefer is when I kicked the hooligan. Eduardo versus Birmingham City. In the 07 or 08 season, Arsenal was on a title charge and went to the Midlands to Birmingham to continue their form. Three minutes into this game, a horrific tackle took place. As to many people, they look back on as the worst injury they have ever seen on a football pitch. With less than three minutes gone at St Andrews, Birmingham City's defender Taylor flew in for a challenge on the Croatian striker Eduardo. As he flew in, Eduardo just nipped the ball away with his foot, leaving Taylor's studs to smash not into the ball, but into his leg. Just above his ankle. I don't even know if I can show the photograph on this video, just in case if it does get demonetized. A replay of this tackle was never shown and Taylor was shown a straight red and received a free match ban, despite calls from the FIFA president Sepp Blatter for that number to be increased. Arsene Wenger initially said that Taylor should never play football again. Taylor claiming that he visited Eduardo in hospital and that an apology was accepted. Eduardo, however, could not even remember his visit or even the tackle itself. Iran v Bahrain 2002. Iran was on the verge of qualifying for the 2002 FIFA World Cup and just needed a win against a mediocre Bahrain side to secure that qualifying spot. However, in this game, a poor Iran barely even had a shot and slumped to a 1-0 defeat, leading them to go into the playoffs and being knocked out by the Republic of Ireland. After being knocked out, a storm broke with journalists alleging that the team had been ordered to take it easy by the Iranian government. Claiming that the government of Iran believes it undesirable for a large number of youths to congregate on the streets of Tehran, which occurred during the last World Cup as Iran beat the US. Not wanting history to repeat itself again, the conspiracy comes that they wanted them to purposely not make it to the World Cup so that this does not happen again. El Maracanazo. In 1990, in a FIFA World Cup qualification game between Brazil, of course, and Chile, Brazil was leading 1-0, in which later on in the game in the second half, the Chilean goalkeeper Roberto Rojas had a flare thrown towards him, in which he pretended to be injured. Flare came towards him, he fell onto the ground in the 67th minute and pretended to be injured. All the Chilean officials, players, led by the captain, left the pitch in protest. The referees could not get them back on the pitch and in response to this, what happened is that Chile got banned from precipitating in a 1990 World Cup qualifiers. They were no longer allowed to play any more games in qualification, even though it was the Brazilian fans that threw the flare to the goalkeeper. And then what makes it worse, the goalkeeper involved Roberto Rojas got banned for life. He, he never played again. Rojas being treated, Patricio Yanez made an obscene gesture to the Brazilian fans by grabbing his genital. This is now later known in Chile as Pato Yanez. Imagine being banned from the World Cup because your goalkeeper pretended to be injured. Like your entire country is out because of one person. That is mental. The 1934 World Cup fixed. So yeah, the, the World Cup was held in Italy in 1954. Italy won it. People like to say that it's fixed and it's dictators towards it and Mussolini. I'm not gonna lie, probably was. Um, this is literally before World War II. I think a lot more crazy things are happening later on. So to imagine this was fixed and some bribes went, in, went on in place, 
probably the least surprising thing I've heard so far in this video. So, uh, probably. <laughs> I don't, yeah, probably. Australia Witch Doctor. In November 1969, the Socceroos travelled to Mozambique to play against what was at the time Rhodesia, or is now Zimbabwe, in a two-part series to qualify for the 1970 World Cup in Mexico. However, in a two-legged match, both games were draws and the third fixture was announced. The story goes that a local journalist gave the Australian team a tip and said that they can use a witch doctor to help them beat the Rhodesian team. They saw it as no harm to give it a chance. So, later that night, a Nyunga went to the pitch where the game was being played and buried some bones near the goalpost and placed a curse on the Rhodesian team. So when they did play that third game, Australia won 3-1. However, when the Nyunga asked to be paid for his services, the players were either unwilling or unable to pay, leading to Nyunga to have a reverse curse on the Socceroos, and that lasted for 35 years. The godfather of Australian football Johnny Warren once spoke of the incident, claiming that from that moment, everything went wrong for the Australian national team. A countless amount of gut-wrenching losses caused the Socceroos to never qualify for a World Cup for many, many years. The last time was in 1974. One famous game was back in 1997 when they had a shock loss to Iran in Melbourne to fail to qualify for the 1998 World Cup. Many believing that the Witch Doctor's curse was still on the Australian national team. So they went out of their way to try to break the curse. So they took matters into their own hands. So the Socceroos traveled back to Mozambique, where they met a couple of Nyungas called Paulinho and Miriam. And on that very same football pitch, where they beat Rhodesia in 1969 and performed a ritual to lift the heads, which included covering saffron in chicken's blood. Saffron went back to Australia and was covered in a special clay. They completed the ritual, and long behold, when Australia played against Uruguay to qualify for the 2006 World Cup, long behold, they qualified for the World Cup, beating them on penalties. This was a true curse that many people believed was actually put on the Socceroos. And you know what? God almighty, I believe it too. Ali Dia. It is often said that it pays to have friends in high places, but in Ali Dia's case, it was his cousin, allegedly, George Weyer, who helped him to win a chance in the Premier League with Southampton. Southampton boss Graham Souness took a call from the former Ballon d'Or winner. George Weyer recommended the 30-year-old Senegal international, who played for the likes of Paris Saint-Germain. Souness took the opportunity and signed Deer up on an initial one-month contract. Two small problems. It wasn't George Weyer that rang him at all. And number two, Deer was a university student in Portsmouth. Ali Deer was named on the bench for a home game against Leeds United, and Dia shockingly made his Premier League debut, being subbed on for Matt Letizia, who was taken off injured 33 minutes into the game. After being subbed on in the 33rd minute, he was subbed off by the 52nd minute. Letizia claimed him to be Bambi on ice. Soon after, George Weyer confirmed that it was not him that called him, and had no idea who Ali Dia was. Southampton sacked him after 14 days into his contract. However, he did live the dream of becoming a Premier League player. The Darkness Fabrice Muramba In the 2011-2012 season, Bolton Wanderers played against Tottenham Hotspur at White Hart Lane. The game went on as normal. However, on the 43rd minute, Fabrice Muramba, the 23-year-old midfielder for Bolton Wanderers, collapsed. The stadium fell silent, and medical staff huddled around him, and the match was abandoned. Fabrice Maramba's heart stopped beating for 78 minutes. Maramba suffered a cardiac arrest in the middle of the football pitch, in what was perhaps the most public cardiac arrest in history, as well as one with the most miraculous ending. Maramba survived this event by incredible reaction from the medical team on the day. Their decisions saved his life after being shocked 15 times before his heart was restarted. Thankfully, Fabrice is still with us to this very day. Even though he may not be able to play football, he is alive. And that is the main thing.
Ryan Mason versus Chelsea. In the 2016-17 Premier League season, Hull City played as Dapper Bridge. Chelsea beat Hull 2-0, but the scoreline didn't matter. Hull City had a corner during the game, and when the ball was crossed in, Ryan Mason and Gary Cahill both competed for the ball, both leaping into the air for a header. When competing for the ball, Cahill missed it, and instead of hitting the ball, it led to a clash of heads with Ryan Mason on the floor for nine minutes straight. Ryan Mason from this incident sustained a fractured skull, leading to 14 metal plates in his skull with 28 screws holding them in place and 45 staples. Due to the location of where the contact took place, it was a very sensitive part of his skull. Ryan Mason could have very easily lost his life this night, as not only was his skull fractured, but had a very high potential for brain damage. 61 minutes after the collision took place, he was already being operated on at St. Mary's Hospital. This decision possibly saved his life, and sadly from this event, Ryan Mason had to retire from football indefinitely. Racing Club Cat Curse One of the most infamous curses in football history, where Argentinian club Racing Club was allegedly cursed back in 1967 by their rivals. This all comes from when they were at their peak in Argentinian football and was at a time one of the most successful Argentinian clubs. This all came from the 1967 Copa Libertadores, where Racing Club beat their rival club, Club Atlético Independiente, in a third playoff match. The story goes that when Racing Club supporters were celebrating their title, Independiente supporters broke into the home stadium of racing and proceeded to bury seven dead cats in the ground of their stadium. And this ritual was supposed to cast a curse on Racing Club. And as stupid as this may seem, it did end up working. Since that day, Racing Club was not the same. As each year that went by, they seemed to get worse and worse, never winning any silverware and then got relegated to the second division in 1983. They did win a Sudamericana in 1988. However, their luck got even worse as the same year Racing faced financial problems and resulted in Racing Club declaring bankruptcy. It was at this stage that Racing Club fans felt like the curse was actually real. So, in hopes to lift the curse, over 100,000 racing club fans gathered and started searching for the seven cat bodies in the grounds of the stadium. And despite their massive number, they only ever found six of the seven buried cat corpses. Therefore, fast forward almost two years later to 2001, and Racing appointed a new manager, Reynaldo Merlo, who immediately declared that he would not be stopped until the last cat body is found. And it went so far that they ordered to dig the entire pitch. They demolished and renovated the entire stadium to get rid of the curse. And it finally paid off as that seven cat body was found. And guess what? That same year, Racing Club won the Argentine Premier Division for the first time since 1966. That means it took 35 years to become the winners of Argentinian football yet again. This is one of the most incredible curses in football history and the fact that things turn good almost immediately adds a lot of weight to this. Yeah, um, so I think you know what's coming and I kind of don't know how to really enter this without really putting myself in hot water here, but I'm gonna try my best. There's two things in here, one that I'm sure you are very well aware of, and another one back in 2005. So let's get into the unknown one first. Both involving Ronaldo and both involving accusations of RPE. On the 19th of October 2005, a article came out from The Guardian claiming that Cristiano Ronaldo was arrested with an inquiry and questioned by the police, claiming that he went voluntarily to a police station to speak to the police regarding an allegation by a woman. The allegations was of SA in a penthouse suite in central London, and Manchester United at this time of course made no comment. The main one that I'm sure you are waiting for is Las Vegas 2009. Now I cannot go too much into detail simply because this is just a complete mess. However, I will give you the broad strokes. In 2009, Ronaldo was in Las Vegas with his brother-in-law and his cousin, and during his time, it's been claimed that he met a model called Catherine Mayorga and alleged that Ronaldo P 
Ida in a Las Vegas hotel. Ronaldo denied all the claims, called him fake news and maintained that the was consensual. Images was found of both people involved together that night in Las Vegas. After these accusations, Ronaldo of course refused it completely and it was reportedly settled outside a court with a roughly $350,000 payout. As it was settled out of court and with an agreement, it stated that this prevented Mayoga from pursuing criminal charges. However, recently from the hashtag to movement claiming that she was pressured and scared of Ronaldo and accepted the settlement. The case was brought back up again in 2021 and the case was dismissed and there's been no update on this since then. However, one thing keeps being brought up is that Ronaldo seems to always avoid America since this case has been reopened. Could it be true that he's avoiding going to the US to avoid potentially being detained? We want to fully know for sure. However, this is definitely something that still remains over the head of Ronaldo and to this day is still active. Adam Johnson. On the 24th of March, 2016, Adam Johnson put the league and a nation into embarrassment as he was sentenced to six years in prison after being found guilty of sexual activity with a child. Adam Johnson pled guilty to kissing and grooming a 15 year old girl. This was at his time at Sunderland and the girl in question was a massive Sunderland fan who was infatuated with Adam Johnson, who he was her hero. Evidence was found of 834 WhatsApp messages between the pair in just over a month. The most interesting part about this story is that despite being arrested on suspicion of having sexual activity with a 15 year old girl and was initially suspended, the suspension lasted for only two matches, who after Gus Poyet was sacked, Dick Advocat took place. Adam Johnson returned back to the club and played in a next match. Despite Johnson being charged with three offences, Sunderland continued to select him while he initially pleaded not guilty to the charges. Adam Johnson continued to play for almost an entire year and his contract was terminated after he pled guilty to sexual activity with a child and grooming. The Abyss 2000 UEFA Cup On the 5th of April 2000, between a semi-final of the UEFA Cup between Leeds United and Galatasaray, a tragic event took place. On the day before the first leg in Istanbul, two Leeds fans were stabbed to death by Galatasaray fans. Four men were arrested and charged. The report stated the following that around 9 o'clock in Istanbul's Taksim Square during a fight between Leeds and Galatasaray fans, it went out of hand. The official Turkish reports stated that Leeds fans were taunting people from local bars, which led to Turkish police being called in to stop fights breaking out. The story goes that a Galatasaray fan ran to a nearby telephone box to call it for support. Several Galatasaray fans, reportedly members of the Night Watchmen they were called, a gang in Istanbul, entered the area and from this, two Leeds fans by the name of Kevin Spate and Christopher Loftus were stabbed to death, aged 40 and 37. Police arrested four people, including Ali Umit Demir. Reports of how the fight broke out are unclear, and due to the nature of this event, I am not going to go into those different stories. However, if you wish to research this yourself, then you can do so. News spread back home of what took place in Istanbul, and it was a very, very sensitive affair. Galatasaray fans were banned from visiting Ellen Road as they cannot simply guarantee their safety. From the semi-final, Galatasaray went on to knock out Leeds from the UEFA Cup. However, the story does not end there. As in the 2000 UEFA Cup final in Copenhagen, this led to even more trouble, known as the Battle of Copenhagen, as Galatasaray went on to play another English team in Arsenal. On the 17th of May 2000, four people were stopped in riots in the City Hall Square. This was viewed as retaliation and revenge by British firms who went out to seek revenge for the people that were killed 
by Galatasaray. Of these hooligan firms, they were the following. The Herd and the Gunas, the Leeds United Service Crew, the Chelsea Headhunters, Rangers, Cardiff City and Swansea City fans and their own separate firms too. A riot broke out in the city square and 2,000 officers were deployed to the area. This led to 19 injuries including 4 stabbings and 60 arrests. Of the people arrested, 19 were British, 36 were Turkish and the rest from Sweden, Germany and the Netherlands. Fortunately, after this riot, despite 19 people being injured, no one came out losing their life, which is the most important thing. An awful timeline in recent European history. Munich, 1958. Other known as the Munich Air Disaster, on the 6th of February 1958, a British European Airways flight carrying the Manchester United football team, including supporters and journalists, crashed on its third attempt to take off in Munich. 44 people were on board, with 23 people losing their lives, with 21 surviving the event. The 1958 Manchester United team, otherwise known as the Busby Babes, were returning from a European Cup match in Belgrade, having eliminated Red Star Belgrade to advance to the European Cup semi-finals. They stopped in Munich to refuel. Pilots James Fane and Kenneth Raymond twice abandoned takeoff because of boost surging in the left engine. Fane rejected an overnight stay in Munich in favour of a third takeoff attempt. By that time, snow started falling and caused a layer of slush to form on the runway. Reported by authorities, the story goes as this, as the plane was taking off, the slush on the runway slowed the plane down too much. This caused the aircraft to plough through a fence beyond the end of the runway, striking a house in the process and a parked fuel truck, causing it to catch fire and explode. Harry Gregg gained consciousness and from this were able to kick a hole to help him escape and help passengers. Among them were teammates Bobby Charlton and Dennis Viollet. From this tragic event, 23 passengers lost their lives. A memorial could be found outside Old Trafford in memory of the officials and players who lost their lives. Bradley Lowry. A young boy called Bradley was a Sunderland fan and in the season of 2016-17, his story captured the hearts of not just the Premier League, but the entire world. Bradley was diagnosed with an illness at just 18 months. That illness was neuroblastoma, and despite him beating the disease initially, it returned in July 2016, and the cancer was subsequently found to have become terminal. Bradley had a strong bond with the Sunderland striker, Jermaine Defoe. The duo first met on September 2016, when Sunderland hosted Everton in the Premier League. Bradley led his beloved Black Cats out onto the pitch as a mascot and received a round of applause during the fifth minute. Supporters of both clubs sang, there's only one, Bradley Lowry. Three months later, Bradley met the four once again as Sunderland played against Chelsea and he was introduced to many of the players and even scored on the pitch and won the official match of the day, goal of the month. The entirety of football came together as players did their part to wish Bradley well. For example, Tridini gave a Christmas card to deliver for Bradley on behalf of the entire Watford squad. Multiple times, Jermaine Defoe and many teammates of Sunderland visited Bradley in hospital. Young Bradley fell asleep on his bed in the arms of the forward. Jermaine Defoe was called up to the England team. Bradley was so happy about hearing the news and as the players took out to Wembley, Jermaine Defoe carried Bradley out in his arms. Jermaine Defoe even went on to score in the 21st minute. However, sadly, on July 7th, 2017, Bradley Lowry lost his battle with neuroblastoma. Following Bradley's passing, Jermaine Defoe said, he was my best friend. He was genuine. He loved his football. He loved me and I loved him. There was nothing I could give him apart from just being a friend. Since his passing, the Bradley Lowry Foundation has been formed and still continues to this day. The link to the foundation is down below in the description. The Vichai Incident On the 27th of October 2018, Vichai's AW169 helicopter crashed outside 
the King Power Stadium shortly after taking off from the pitch. Vichai was the chairman of Leicester City, who him and his son Ayawat purchased a club in 2010. With Vichai in charge, he transformed Leicester from a side in the championship and took them to the dream of winning the Premier League title in 2015-2016. From this event, Vichai gifted all 19 players a BMW i8 at £100,000 each as a gift for winning the title. From many stories from fans and players and managers, everyone had great respect of Vichai and the way that he represented not just himself, his family, but the football club. Vichai was on board with five other people who all lost their lives. On that aircraft was Vichai himself, his two members of staff, Cave Pun, Pornpair and Nusara Soknamai, British pilot Eric Swafner and his Polish girlfriend Isabella Rosa Lehovich. The cause of the tragic event was as the pilot turned the helicopter towards its en route heading, the tail rotor control linkage broke, sending the helicopter into an uncontrollable spin. One witness described the aircraft falling like a stone to the floor. As it struck the ground, it burst into flames. A rescue attempt was made, but sadly, it was too late. An horrific event in Premier League history. And his legacy, with his son still in charge of Leicester, still continues to this day, as heartfelt tributes was given when Leicester City won the FA Cup in 2021. Heisel, 1985. We have come to the end of this video, and sadly, we all knew that this was coming. On the 29th of May 1985, the European Cup final between Juventus and Liverpool took place. The report states that mostly Juventus fans escaping a breach by Liverpool fans were pressed against a collapsing wall at Heysel Stadium in Brussels, causing 600 non-fatal injuries and 39 fatalities. Approximately an hour before the match, early warning signs were being shown of what may happen ahead. Both supporters were separated by a flimsy divide which was seen as a neutral section for the European Cup final by those who purchased tickets in Belgium. As items were being thrown back and forth, the fence were ripped down and fighting took place. The fans in a neutral section began to run away from the Liverpool fans. Fans that were already near the wall were crushed. Eventually, the wall collapsed, allowing others to escape, but leading to a majority of deaths. Despite all of this that happened before the game, the match was still played, even after a state of siege was declared in the city, and Juventus went on to win that game 1-0. Due to what took place, UEFA banned all English football clubs from playing in European competitions for five seasons. Liverpool for six. 14 Liverpool fans were found guilty darkest hour in the history of UEFA competitions. Of the 39 people who lost their lives, 32 were Italian, four Belgian, two French, and one from Northern Ireland, the youngest being the age of 11. Investigations took place with UEFA holding the stance with saying, and I quote, only the English fans were responsible. Of that, there is no doubt. It always feels uncomfortable to talk about Heisel, and even as an Englishman, I never really heard about Heisel really at all growing up until in my later years that I went out and researched it myself. I think for obvious reasons, this dark period in English football history has been rubbed away and I don't want Liverpool fans to think that I'm putting all the blame on them, however, this is the official history. A memorial can be found outside Anfield in St John's Gardens in Liverpool at the Juventus headquarters in the hometown of victim Claudio Savaroni, a sculpture outside the new Heysel Stadium and at the J Museum in Turin. In the first meeting since the tragic event in the 2005 Champions League, before the first leg at Anfield, Liverpool fans held up placards to form a banner saying Amrizia, meaning friendship in Italian. While some Juve fans applauded, others turned their backs. Juve fans displayed banners reading, easy to speak, 
difficult to pardon. And another saying, 15485 Sheffield, God exists. The second banner in reference to the Hillsborough disaster. A truly awful event and one which is still very sensitive to this day. So lads, there you have it. I hope you guys found this interesting, at least some stories in it you may not have known. I'll be honest, some of these I never even knew. So I hope that you learned something today, because I know that I most definitely have. Tell me down below in the comments, what did I miss out on, and which iceberg should I do next. I do enjoy making these, and I hope that you guys do enjoy them. Feel free and subscribe to the channel. And of course, do not forget, Cold Iceberg for 15% off all items at my football printer company, mazzolodesigns.co.uk. Link is down below at the top of the description. And there you go, boys. I'll see you next time. Peace out.